to the book of Joshua today. So if you have your Bible with you, please open up to the book of Joshua, chapter 20. Uh, we have switched up a little bit of our arrangements uh, as opposed to how we usually uh, do the service. Uh, hope it's not too awkward for you guys. Uh, I really feel like, I feel so intimate with the front row even more now. <laughs> All right, so uh, Joshua chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. We're going to be looking into these six verses together. If we have found the passage, let's send the reverence of the Word of God, and I will go first, and uh, you guys go second, and we'll alternate until the last verse. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of... Oh, sorry. <laughs> the Lord said to the Joshua... That the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there, they shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. And if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not give up the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. He shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is high priest at the time. The manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, to the town from which he fled. Amen. We may sit. Uh, the Heavenly Father, may the Word of God be illuminated to us. Lord, let it not be just an ancient text to us, but let it be a relevant living Word of God to which we can hold on to and cling on to so that we can live and for your glory and whether we need comfort or need refuge, that you can provide that for us, Lord. Dear Lord, have mercy on us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, so recently I've been just... I'm only watching some Switzerland videos. I don't know. <laughs> and like, you know, I, I don't know. When you think of Switzerland, what do you think of? Like, what, what pops up to your head? T- Tobolone? <laughs> Chocolates? Uh, oh, I hear a lot of whispers, but I, I cannot. <laughs> Swiss? Snow. Snow, yeah. Uh, Roger Federer. You know him? the greatest tennis player, uh, one of the greatest. And, you know, and they're also known as a nation of neutrality. That's one thing I kind of found. Uh, they're known as a nation of neutrality. But for a nation of neutrality, they have lots of army reserves. And they're really into training. They, you also need to go to army if you are a Switzerland person, a Swiss. And one of the reasons for that is during the World War II, Um, the German threat was real for them, and what they decided to do was build a fortress. Build a fortress on the Swiss Alp, on the mountain. And if you, this is like a common knowledge, I'm not making a conspiracy theory. Uh, If you just simple Google or even YouTube, you can see that on the mountain there are many bases. They have uh, cannons that are hidden within the mountain that you you can obviously see, not too hidden, I guess. Uh, And you can also access into the bunkers in case there's a war that you can go into. Switzerland, they have a bunker for every single citizen in Switzerland. It's covered over 100%. It's at least 110%. So if there's a nuclear war, like I heard like recently during the Ukraine war that's happened, the Germans, they kind of, you know, with the nuclear war capability that, that the Russian side have, they were consulting with the Switzerland people. Hey, can I get some bunker like toilets and other things? Like I heard there are things like that going on recently. Um, All to say that if you go to Switzerland, you will have a refuge, somewhere to go to, somewhere to hide yourself, even for a a country of neutrality, that is the case. And just as Switzerland has these defense mechanisms and shelters for physical protections against armed enemies, uh, God is also somebody who provides shelter. God provides refuge as a place of safety. And if we're looking into the book of Joshua, last week we covered Joshua chapter 10, and after that there are stories of conquesting, 
and there are stories about inheritance. But one thing we notice in the middle of the inheritance story, we see God setting apart cities of refuge. It seems a little off, but that is something God has in mind. And I want us to kind of go into why God does that and what we can learn about God from this, this fact that he in the middle of inherit, uh, giving out inheritance and conquesting the people, uh, why he has this concept of refuge in there. So the main point for today will be God in his justice and mercy provides refuge for all who seeks it. God in his justice and mercy provides refuge for all who seeks it. You know, as a Christian, I, and I think we should believe that the world needs refuge. Everyone in this world needs refuge. I think the Switzerland people kind of had a right uh, with being aware that the war is imminent and you never know when you're going to get invaded. So we need a place where we need a refuge because this world is broken. There was war before. There will be war in the future. So there will be something keep going on. So we need to be prepared. That's the mind of the Switzerland people. And as a Christian, we should also be aware. If the Switzerland people are aware, we should also be aware that everyone needs a refuge because this world is broken. And everyone, including even those in prison. You know, I mentioned to you before that I used to play in basketball a couple of times, not used to, a few times, uh, in San Quentin prison. And this is Cornell Swine, if you see on the picture. He used to lead, and he, I used to go to school with him. And he uh, ministers, he spearheads the ministry in the prison uh, these days. Uh, his goal is not to go and just play basketball with the talented people in the prison. His goal is to play through participating in competitive sports to reach out to them with the gospel. The purpose is to reach out to them to the gospel because he realized pretty early on that the world is broken and people need Jesus, including the people in the prison. And he also says that uh, there are a lot of things that he can emphasize with the inmates because of how he also grew up. For example, he talked about an inmate's burden. This inmate, he grew up in a family ravaged by rape, drug abuse, depression, and violence. And full of rage at the age of 19 years old, he killed another man. And Connell said that this is a story that really sits on me because it is not very different than my story or any of the stories of the people that I grew up with. When I go in there, I see all the brokenness, I see me. You see, the brokenness was heavily exposed to my friend Kunel and also to the inmate. Both of them were exposed to it, and they sought refuge, or how can I solve this brokenness or the pain that I have inside of me? They were seeking refuge. Kunel found Jesus, and the inmate resorted to violence to alleviate his pain. He chose to murder. I believe that this world is looking for either refuge or living in a delusion. The delusion that the world is perfect or that it should be perfect and it can be fixed by a solution that human can give with enough effort. And Paul David Tripp is one of the theologians, uh, a pastor, a book writer. He says this about delusion in marriage. Um, he says that he has seen many who got married with delusions. Uh, he says that he worked with struggling husbands and wives, not taking that they are both flawed people living in a fallen world. So they have unrealistic expectation and come to extreme disappointments when they start to react of one another's weaknesses, their flaws, instead of their strengths. Instead of relying on wisdom from the word of God, instead of seeking for the power of the grace of God, they scrutinize each other and demand perfection from each other. And if the unrealistic expectation of perfection is not met, then they get divorced or wait for somebody who will meet up to the expectations of perfection. And we're living in the 21st century. If you cannot find somebody who meets your expectation, then live independently, live individualistically, live self-sufficiently. Delusion 
of this world. Perhaps because we are not exposed to brokenness as much. You know, sometimes adults or our parents, I don't know if they did that, but sometimes we try to protect our children or next generation from being exposed to brokenness. And to a certain degree, it's something that, yes, parents should do. But perhaps to the point of it being blinding to us, to the fact that the world is full of brokenness and not being aware of it. Perhaps we just avoided them altogether and don't realize there are people suffering in the world and there are brokenness even within the family and that the people need refuge from those brokenness and that is not supposed to be how it's supposed to be. We look at the news, persecution for being certain nationalities, war, violence, armed conflicts between people, We see greed, we see manipulations, even from our school, from our jobs. Perhaps we don't want to look at it. Perhaps we don't want to be exposed to it. Perhaps we don't want to confront it. Because at times when we face them, we lose our heart. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1 through 5, it says this. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebedee, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Avon, and east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to them, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people go a toil up there, for they are few. So about three thousand men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Their hearts melted. God chose not to fight for the people in Ai because ancient sinned. And they experienced defeat and terror. And they came back to the reality of the broken world that you can lose a war when God is not on your side. And they desire to go back to the wilderness that they came from. Now they are a generation after coming out from Egypt, so their best iteration of a perfect world is the wilderness, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. And they want to go back to there as if that's the refuge for them. They lost their heart. Sometimes when we're living in this world, we lose our heart when we're confronted with the brokenness, especially if it's really right in front of us or involve ourselves, right? Losing heart. We lose heart when our solutions or our refuge gets taken away. You know, um, about two weeks ago, uh, I also experienced a losing of my heart. It was about five days. And one of the reasons why I had this um, five days of losing my heart was because um, of I finally had the time to reflect over the past one year. After coming back from the trip, uh, you know, we all know if you're from this church, that mission trip training, it, it is a lot. So after training, after going to mission trip, after coming back, after doing everything, uh, trying to get adjusted and get cut up to work, I finally had time, a room in my heart, to think through and process what has happened. Everything that has been going on. And the... I, I had the Schindler moment. Have you, any of you watched Schindler List? It's a, it's a great movie. Uh, also a very sad movie. <laughs> and I think the ending is one of the saddest movies that I've seen. And I watched it in high school, and I, I remember crying in the classroom with no shame because of how sad it was. Because the Schindler, um, the guy who was trying to rescue the Jews from the Nazis and from the concentration camp, he saved over 1,000 people, but at the end of the war, 
as he's saying goodbye to the, all the Jews that he saved, he starts to break down, looking at himself. If I made more money, I could have saved one more. I threw so much away the money for something else. If I sold this car, I could have saved ten. If I sold this pin on my coat, I could have saved two or at least one. I could have saved so more, but I didn't do enough. So he's go through this、um, dialogue with the Jewish leader, and man, it was sad. And、uh, that that's kind of what I went through as I was reflecting upon、uh, past one year. Could I could I have done more? How, how could I have done more? How could I have taken care of my family more? How could I have taken care of the church more? What could I have done? And Man, that was rough five days. But after five days, thanks to the Lord, you know, I was able to come out. And if I've been walking with the Lord for past nineteen years, and one thing I realize is that I can wait upon the Lord, especially when the dark time comes, because He is my refuge. Psalm chapter twenty-seven, verse fourteen says this: "Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord." Experienced multiple times in my life. Whenever I lose my heart, and I do lose my heart sometimes, less often these days. But especially in the beginning phase of my walk in Jesus Christ, I used to lose my heart so often. But each time, God would take me out. God would rescue me, and I realized that I can wait for the Lord. And I remember telling the youth group last Friday,、uh, not. Last Friday, last last Friday, I'm going through a bit of rough time, but I know I can wait for the Lord and He will rescue me. I told you guys that because I re- I experienced rescuing from the Lord, and He has. Joshua chapter twenty, verse one through three. Then the Lord said to Joshua, "Say to the people of Israel, appoint the cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses." That the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or unknowingly may flee there, there shall be for you a refuge from the avenger of blood. We know that God is our refuge because,、uh, from personal experiences or other people telling such experiences, but we also know, most importantly, through the Scripture, God here provides refuge, cities of refuge. You know, before Joshua crossed into the、uh, across the Jordan River, there were already cities of refuge designated on the eastern side, three cities. And when they crossed into the western side, they also、uh, God reminded Joshua, and Joshua reminded everyone that three more cities are to be designated as a city of refuge, somewhere where you can run to when you unintentionally kill somebody. Because there might be avengers of blood coming your way. You know, God is so practical, and God knows the heart of the people so well. God is so practical. God is so He knows people. And this is just from my personal like at playground. My Kathy was playing around, and she's barely eighteen, nineteen months old. So she she has pretty good control of her body, but you know she was still working on that.、Uh, but this four-year-old girl, she ran down the slide. And she bumped into my Kathy, shouldered her, almost knocked her down, and just ran off. Thankfully, I was with my wife. If I was not with my wife, because I heard she was starting to whimper, and I was not happy, I was ready to chase that girl down. <laughs> and my eyes met with the four-year-old girl's mom, and she was like, "So sorry." I said, "Sorry is not enough." <gasps> I was out for blood. I was ready to go out. But what if something worse happens? What if worse happens to somebody that you love? You'll be out for blood. I lost my rationality when that happened. It happens, even if it's by accident. If somebody you love is hurt or killed. Highly likely that somebody in your family will lose their rationality and chase you down and call out for blood. 
even if it was by accident. God is practical. So God says to make these cities of refuge. And if you also do, we have yeah. If we also look at the cities of refuge, you can see that they're pretty proportionally and uh, spread out within Israel. They were purposely located in places where you can run to them in one day. Not somebody so far away that you cannot reach them. They were all located in places so that anybody could go and find them. So nobody in Israel was left out. So everybody can find a refuge and ask for a fair trial instead of being by, met by the avengers out for blood, trying to make all things even if that is even possible. Through this, we can see that God cares about not only justice, but he cares about also fairness for the people. God cares that people will get their fair trial and that people will have a place to run to. And these cities, they're also named in verses 7 through 8. Uh, we don't know what they mean, but in Hebrew, I looked them up, and these are the city names. Kadesh, it means sanctuary. Golan means enclosure. Ramath means heights or uplifted. Shechem means shoulder. Bezer, uh, Bezer means fortress. And Hebron means companion. It's like Eureka, uh, three hours up. You're going to the city of Eureka, you're thinking about gold or something, right? So as, you're, as a Hebrew person, when you're running to these places, you're thinking about sanctuary. Uplifted, that you will be uplifted. Shoulder that you can lean onto. Fortress that you can hide in. A companion that you can run to. Wouldn't you possibly be thinking about these things? These cities are not named lawless city. A dystopian city that you can run to where the laws do not exist. God is not saying the law is the issue. Like sometimes how we think law is the issue. That is not what God is saying. That's not the name of the cities. But even in the midst of the law, God is saying that you have a place to run to, to ask for a fair trial and to seek refuge against the avengers of blood. Even if you're a foreigner, even if you're not an Israelite, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 9, it says, These were the cities designated for all the people of Israel, and for the strangers sojourning among them, that anyone who killed a person without intent could flee there, so that he might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood, till he stood before the congregation. God does not play favorites. God does not favor certain types of people. Not just the Israelites, not just the Asians. God cares for all, even strangers. He can be sought out. But you know, I believe that this is under representation of the mercy of God. Here we have cities of refuge that you can run to if you unintentionally have committed murder. But we know that God is greater than that. That even if we have intentionally committed sin and participated in the broken world like that inmate who chose to kill a man at 19 years old, that you can still run to God for refuge. Because the solution of this broken world is not the law. It's not some ideologies. It's not some person or something else. But the solution that we can find in this broken world is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is somebody that we can run to. Whether we have unintentionally committed sin or even intentionally committed sin. Joshua chapter 20 verse 6 it says, And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is high priest at the time, that the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home to the town from which he fled. Jesus Christ is a better high priest 
than to what we see in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ, our high priest, has already died. But he was raised back to life by the power of God's mercy for all. Jesus Christ is the refuge for our soul, no matter what kind of state that we are in, whether we have intentionally or unintentionally have gotten there. You know, sometimes we, we don't seek for refuge in God because we feel like it was our own doing that we got there. It was our own mess that we got there. It was our own faults that we got there. And we believe that, well, God, yes, of course, He will provide protection for those who unintentionally and who deserve protection, but surely not me. I have intentionally went distant from Jesus Christ. I have intentionally chosen to pursue the life of sin instead of holiness. So the current brokenness I'm experiencing, I cannot go, I cannot go to God. That is a lie. That is a lie. We can run to Jesus because we need to think of what Jesus Christ did. He did not go onto the cross for the people who accidentally fallen into the life of sin. Yes, for them too. But Jesus, what he did on the cross was he took the guilt of the people intentional and unintentional, and he was nailed on the cross for the guilty verdict that awaited for us all. Unintentional and intentional. He was crucified on the cross for all, and he took the price that we deserved and was crucified, dead, That is why we can run to Jesus. Because that was his purpose and intention of why he went to the cross. Jesus did not come for the righteous. Jesus did not come for the people who accidentally stepped into the miry pit. But he came for the sick. He came for the guilty. He came for sinners. According to the book of gospel. According to Jesus, he came for the sick. Jesus also said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are, who mourn. Blessed are the meek. These are the who are the blessed. Those who are poor in spirit, who mourn and who are meek. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they will be comforted. For they will inherit the earth. That is who Jesus Christ is. We can run to Jesus. You know, some of us might have be going through a season of having lost our heart. And maybe we are whipping ourselves saying, well, the reason I lost my heart is because of what I did, so I deserve it. So maybe we are dwelling there. Or maybe we lost heart because we tried our best to solve the solution, solve the issue, but brokenness is still there. What could I have done? What could I have done? We might have lost our heart for different reasons. But one thing's for sure. We see from the scripture that God is somebody who provides cities of refuge. And God also provided his one and only son as the refuge that we can run to. Jesus Christ is much better than what the Old Testament, the cities of refuge, which it was for only the unintentional. And you had to go through the fair trial, but Jesus Christ went through the trial. And even if he is found guilty, which we are all are, He's the one who paid the price. We can run to Jesus Christ. So what does his knowledge of God, the being provider of refuge for us, what does that, what, what does that do for us? What does that mean? 
What does the knowledge of the salvation that Jesus Christ brings His one and only Son that through Him is brought the salvation and refuge for us, what does that mean for us? What should we do with this knowledge? And what should we do if we have conviction in our heart that that is the case? What should we do? Well, first of all, we can run to Jesus. What else can we do? For those who, if you have experienced the refuge of Jesus Christ, and if you have experienced His salvation and rescue multiple times, if you have experienced that you can wait upon the Lord, what we can do is that we can also point people to Jesus. You know, these cities of refuge... Jewish people in the past, they used to maintain the paved road to the cities of refuge so that the people who would be running away would not stumble and fall because of the, the conditions of the road. And also, when they were running, there were signs saying the cities of refuge ahead, the refuge ahead. There were signs. As Christians, we should not become a stumbling block to people from coming to Jesus Christ, right? We should be paving the way for the people to seek refuge somewhere, especially to Jesus Christ. And we should point to the people, there is refuge in Jesus. So how can we practically uh, pave the way? I think one thing that we can think about is, uh, as the praise team, if you guys can uh, prepare for our... Uh, one thing that we can think of is the brokenness that we have experienced. What are the brokenness that you have experienced? For Cornell, it was very similar to the inmates who were in the prison. That's why he chooses to go there and continue the ministry because he knows, he experienced... So he wants to pave the way to Jesus Christ there. But what are the brokenness that we have experienced? And whenever, if we can experience the delivery from the Lord, from that brokenness, whatever it might be, we are, we are going through different things and experience different hardships in life. But when we experience those deliverance from those brokenness, those experiences become a bridge for people to cross over to Jesus Christ. Seeing that we also have gone through similarities. We also have gone through those brokenness, but they have found Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they have found Him as the comfort and the refuge. Those brokenness that we experience also opens our eyes to the people who are experiencing similar things. I can notice people who are going through similar traumas that I went through. And you can also start to notice things when, that you have not before after experiencing brokenness that other people are going through. There's a reason That's not too comforting to people who are going through, <laughs> if you're going through brokenness. But God can use your brokenness. It can be used as way to Jesus Christ himself. But God is for the poor. God is for the mo those who mourn. God is for the brokenhearted. That's who God is for. That's who Jesus Christ came down for. So at this time, I want us to enter into time of prayer. Are there brokenness that you are experiencing in your life that you want to escape from, that you want to run away from? We might have tried many different solutions, many different ways, and even choosing violence, even choosing ways that are more participating in the brokenness perhaps to alleviate the pain or to escape from it but the scripture tells us that it is God that we can run, in, run to 
God is fair and God cares and God provides the cities of refuge in the midst of the war so that the people can run and flee and be protected and to be provided for. If you are going through some sort of brokenness today, I pray that you will find comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. For he says, come those who are weary and burdened, for my yoke is light. I pray that we'll be able to put down the yoke that we are trying to carry, the burden that we are trying to shoulder, and to lean on the shoulder of Jesus Christ instead. For he is the solution, so he is the refuge for all our problems. Let us pray. who perhaps have experienced the delivery from the Lord and found comfort in Him. Pray that um, that our eyes will be open to those who are brokenhearted, those who are poor in spirit, those who are mourning, and those who are in need of comforting. Those who are in need of to hear that Jesus Christ is waiting for them. whether they have intentionally or unintentionally have gotten to where they are. That, that's who Jesus is. Let's pray that our eyes will be open to the brokenhearted, to the brokenness, to the people and places that God wants us to look at. Let us pray.
choose to pray if you want to pray more but let us join the praise team and the uh, praise the lord I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker. of heaven I give it all to you God trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me I give it all to you God trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hand wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hand wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hand wide open. I will climb this mountain with my hand. There's nothing I hold on to. 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 Nothing I hold on to. There's nothing I hold on to. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker of Heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker of Heaven. I give it all to You, God, trusting that You'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to You, God, trusting that. Make something beautiful out of me. Dear me, Father, you have told Joshua to be strong and courageous, for you shall cause the people to inherit the land. You told them to be strong and very courageous, being careful to do everything according to the law of Moses, not turning from it right hand or to the left. That you may have good success wherever you go, for the letting the word of God not to depart from His mouth, for Him to meditate it on a day and night, so that He will be careful to do everything according to it. He has commanded you have commanded Him to be strong and courageous, not to be frightened, not to be dismayed, for the Lord God is with Him wherever He goes. Lord, this promise is also for us, Lord. Lord, you are with us, Lord, and wherever we go, we are asked, we are commanded to be strong and courageous and to not fall into dismay, not to be frightened, Lord. But Lord, there are times when we are, and Lord, you are the refuge for us. So help us run to you, Lord. 
Would you restore our hearts, Lord? And if some of us are in a place where we are frightened and dismayed, Lord, I pray that we'll be able to pray like the psalmist to wait. I wait upon the Lord. For the Lord is with me. For the Lord will restore me. Would you give us patience? Would you help us wait upon you and change the fixation of our eyes upon ourselves and the issues and brokenness upon you, Jesus Christ? For Lord, you are our refuge, you are our fortress, you are our rock. Help us experience that and help us point to the people who might be in need of experiencing you, Jesus Christ. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.